Well, in the news this week, the state of Michigan recently pulled a substantial amount of retirement investments out of a fund that was directed by a billionaire named Kenneth Fisher. Michigan, like a number of investors in Fisher's funds, was disturbed by recent comments that Fisher had made in a speech in California. You see, the wealthy investor was giving a seminar in which he used coarse and offensive words laced with sexual innuendo that most people thought denigrated women. For example, Fisher used an analogy that wooing wealthy clients was like picking up a girl at a bar. I've talked like this many times before, said the billionaire. He defended his remarks and he said, and it never caused a problem for people before. But people did get upset and Fisher's company lost over $2 billion worth of investors. A Wall Street performance coach who's familiar with the industry and with Fisher said, in his mind, he probably doesn't mean any harm, but he literally just doesn't get it. Fisher would go on to apologize, of course, he didn't apologize for his remarks, but he apologized for accepting the invitation to come and speak at the seminar in the first place. Now, this story is not surprising to most of us, this idea that a person of great power and wealth could be so out of touch with mainstream understandings of ethics and propriety, it's literally a caricature in our modern society, as most of us need not look very far to find other contemporary examples of people whose outsized opinions of themselves regularly cloud what most people would consider honest and fair judgment. Here at church, we need look no further than, further than our gospel reading this morning and this famous story of the Pharisee and the publican. Two men go to the temple to pray, and we hear the Pharisee first. From the outset, this religious leader demonstrates his immodest appreciation for his own stature. His honest assessment is that he's better than other people, thieves, rogues, even this tax collector. And he assumes that the good Lord shares his opinion. Meanwhile, the tax collector, he stays back, and he's, he's too convicted to even raise his head, simply saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And here Jesus condemns the first and commends the second. Jesus commends humility, which is nothing more, in my mind, than realism, knowing who we are and what we've done. To be humble, in most cases, when we think about it, is to be real. And to be real is to be humble. And we're not too surprised that Jesus upholds this. Christians have long known the benefits of humility. These days, social scientists are helping to articulate that for us. For example, Dr. Elizabeth Cumro Mancuso, she's from Pepperdine University in Malibu, and she's conducting an ongoing study on humility, on how humility might benefit you as a human. She's assembling questionnaires and she's asking hundreds of participants questions like this, true or false? I feel small when others disagree with me on important topics. True or false? I think others have more to learn from me than I have to learn from them. Then she scores these questionnaires. And you may be encouraged to know that 10 to 15% of the population ranks as rather humble. Mancuso also found that those who score highest on these humility tests are less polarized on political and ideological issues. She's also found that they're less aggressive and less judgmental towards members of other religious groups. Researchers note that if you have a humble disposition, it can be critical to sustaining a committed long-term relationship. It can also nourish mental health more broadly because humility helps us shake off grudges. It helps us suffer fools patiently. And it helps us to forgive oneself more quickly. Humility. God wants it for you and me because God loves you and me and the world. And when we talk about humility, especially at church, it's important that we shed this idea of weakness because that's always associated with humility is that you're, you're weak. To be humble, as Jesus was, does not mean being passive or weak. It simply means being aware, being a realist. This is exactly what the Pharisee was. He was, put, he was out of touch with who he was and his purpose in the world. 
And this is what I think Jesus is getting to for you and me. Jesus wants you and me to be more real, more aware of who we are and who we aren't, more aware of what we can do and what we can't do, and more aware of ourselves so we can be more aware of others. Here's a definition of humility in doing research for the sermon that I came across. Humility is an interpersonal stance that is other-oriented rather than self-focused. It is characterized by an ability to act, accurately acknowledge one's limitations and one's ability. Humility, an interpersonal stance that is other-oriented rather than self-focused. It is characterized by an ability to accurately acknowledge one's limitations and one's abilities. In other words, being humble simply means looking in the mirror and seeing what's there, the good and the bad, the dingy and the shiny. It's recognizing and accepting our humanity, spirit, soul, and body, created by God, who called it not just good, but very good in the book of Genesis, and redeemed it in all of its frailty by Christ on the cross. An author I like, named Barbara Brown Taylor, she writes this, quote, my life depends on engaging the most ordinary physical activities with the most exquisite attention I can give them. My life depends on ignoring all touted distinctions between the secular and the sacred, the physical and the spiritual, the body and the soul. What is saving me right now is becoming more fully human, trusting that there is no way to God apart from real life in the real world. And this is the challenge, I think, for you and me and for the Kenneth Fishers of the world, who may or may not realize that God is all around us and that our lives are about growing in awareness of God's presence and knowing that our blind spots are often harming others. Our lack of awareness, no matter how big or small it may be, is often doing more harm than we probably know. What's the saying? Our biggest problem is we don't know what the problem is. And the solution, my friends, is awareness. Awareness of God, awareness of ourselves, awareness of others. Jesus' parable challenges you and me to find ways to get off this treadmill we call life long enough to take a look at ourselves, perhaps asking others what they see, perhaps reflecting on the day that's passed and ruminating on all that's happened, the good and the bad, and what that's telling us. Do we take time at the end of the day? to take a look at the people we met, the, the, the books or magazines or websites that had an effect on us. I think this is a part of the awareness of God's presence in our lives and purpose for our lives as well. There's nothing that we all do in it that's an accident. It's all known and it's given to us for a variety of purposes, and one is to make us more aware. The other week I told the story about my friend Jane, who, who really enjoyed life by the anticipation, the experience, and the reflection. And how often we forget the reflection is so important. How is God working in your life this morning to make you more aware of who you are, what's going on around you? The performance coach that I mentioned earlier said this about Kenneth Fisher and his cluelessness. He said, you know, if he were my client, I would walk him through why he says these things and ask him what he's trying to accomplish. Do we take that time to reflect? Awareness. How might we become more aware? Friends, if God wants anything for the church, it's for us to be more real, to drop the facades, to let Christ, who I can see shining through each one of you so, so brightly, to be known. The Pharisee remained hidden in his haughtiness, estranged from himself, the truth, and thus his God-given mission to serve. This kind of behavior is not to be imitated or worshipped, but pity and pray for. He, like we, do sometimes choose the comfort of cluelessness and the pseudo-innocence of ignorance. But God is trying to wake us up. What happened to us this week that tried to wake us up? How is God using the things that are happening all around us to bring us to greater places of reality, realism, and humility? God is calling us out of our judgmentalism and high-mindedness, our sense of superiority and entitlement. While it's easy to point the fingers at others, we know it all starts here. Here's my heart. 
take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God is calling us out. And why is God calling us out? Because God's calling us in. Saints, you are kind, you are faithful, you are generous, you are selfless. I would rather be here than no place else, walking the journey with you. This atrium and this roof that we're going to dedicate in a little bit is a sign of your care. Not just for yourselves, but for others, because this thing can outlast a lot of us. As many people will never know will come to this place, and they will be fed physically and socially and spiritually, and you are making this happen. Through this building, God is going to use us to go further and deeper and farther with Jesus. God is inviting us through the renewal of our space, of our life together, to draw closer to him. What does that look like in your life? What does drawing closer to that voice look like? Friends, God is looking to reach even deeper places of compassion in and around us. God is asking us to go deeper in compassion, in patience, in generosity, and humility. And may it all start today. I would like to invite our senior warden.